Web Applications in .NET 6 with Andrew Locke. The Azure DevOps Podcast is a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Each show brings you hard-hitting interviews with industry experts, innovating better methods, and sharing success stories. Listen on to learn how to increase quality, ship quickly, and operate well. And now your host, Jeffrey Palermo. Welcome to the show. I'm Jeffrey Palermo, your host for helping you and your teams move fast, deliver quality, and run your software with confidence in Azure, all while using everything that the .NET ecosystem has to offer. The podcast is sponsored by ClearMeasure, a software architecture company that empowers .NET teams to be self-sufficient and able to deliver world-class results. ClearMeasure is hiring architects and .NET engineers who'd like a path to become an architect, and so you can go to clearmeasure.com slash careers to find out more information. Our guest today on the show is Andrew Locke. He is a senior software engineer at Datadog. He's working out of Devon in the UK. And he's a Microsoft MVP. That stands for Most Valuable Professional. He's the author of ASP.NET Core in Action and has an active blog all about his experience working with .NET and ASP.NET Core. Andrew, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? Thanks very much. It's good to be here. I'm good. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, you know, I'm really glad to, to, to be able to interview you um, because uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that, that used to blog but not only writing a book, but you actually keep up with your blog, and and many of my colleagues, you know, have mentioned how much how useful they you know your blog posts are, and when they search for things, they just come right back to some of the posts that that you've put up there. Um, so when I ask about it, uh, what what keeps the joy of blogging going for you? And so many people have gone to the micro blogging and social media, you know, sentences. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's. For one thing is having people saying how much value they get out of it. That certainly is a driver for it. Um, but to be honest, I, I started blogging as a way of learning ASP.NET Core, just mm -hmm. because having to write things down means you actually have to know uh, a little bit of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So it, it sort of prompted me to dig into it. And, you know, I have this sort of inability to drop things halfway. So I've been doing it every uh, every week now for six years. But, but part of it is just the joy of learning more things and putting something out there. It's, it's uh, yeah, it's just, it's quite rewarding. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you about, about your book also, because not many people write books. Um, <laughs> I think what less than, less than, far less than 1% of the world's population ever writes a book. Uh, but, but leading up to that, what are the, I always like to ask, what are the high points in your programming career that kind of steered you in the direction that you're going today? Yeah, well, I, I started relatively late. It wasn't until I went to university that I was really interested in programming at all. I um, I, I dabbled a little bit in, with basic back. My dad tried to mm. convince me to play it, but I, it, it didn't interest me. The getting numbers on the screen didn't do anything for me. It was only when I got to university and we started having courses. Um, it was in C and C++ and yeah. then design patterns and that, that's where it really, really sort of sparked my interest. And so I started doing as many courses of that as I could at uni um, and carried that on for the next few years to like master's and PhD and things. But it was always just on the side. And it was only then when I started to do the jobs were all about the programming. And that was when I discovered .NET. And suddenly .NET was so much easier to work with than uh, C++. And trying to do visual things with C++ was, was painful. So um, that, that all steered me towards .NET. And then... Moving on from there, so I had a, had a couple of jobs with that, and one of the jobs that was around 2015, 2016 was um, doing ASP.NET development, but with a Mac. So you were always working on a Mac in in parallels in a VM. So you always had the the difficulty with that to try and work inside a VM all the time, all conflict with the shortcuts, and that's when ASP.NET Core started to be sort of um, really talked about as this Project K or V V Next. And that, that's what I got really interested because in, suddenly I meant I wouldn't need to have a, a, a VM anymore. I could just work directly on the Mac and it would be fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that, that's when I decided to start the blog to look into it. And from there, that's where the uh, uh, Manning reached out after seeing the, the, the blog and um, yeah, went from there. Okay. So 
your book ASP.NET Core in action is is out there, and, and it's been out there for what two? I have to look at it, two three years. Yeah, there's there's a second edition now, so um, it's. I can't, nice. I, I can't remember the first one. Very nice. first one. The first one came out about in the 2.0 era, and then the second edition covers .NET 5. Awesome, awesome. Um, so I want to I ask, just because I know that a lot of listeners probably have this question or, and they're not clear, what is, can, can you kind of go over .NET Core and now we have .NET 5, .NET 6? Can you demystify that just so that everybody knows how to, to think about all these different names that are running around now. Yeah, there's 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 a lot of things here. So you, .NET can mean a lot of different things. Um, back in the day, there was a .NET framework, which is the old Windows only, the, the stable but bloated, shall we say, uh, framework, which is what everyone outside of, you know, who, who, who aren't on the .NET core sort of bandwagon at the moment, that's what people think of a lot of the time when they're thinking about .NET, it's the old .NET framework. Um, .NET Core was a reimagining of that, which was meant to be extracting just the core parts to make it um, far more composable, cross-platform, cloud-ready. So it runs on Linux, it runs on Mac, it runs on Windows. Um, and that was pulled out in sort of 20, 2016, I think was the first uh, release. And that, so that was .NET Core 1.0. And then there was some iteration on that, 1.1, 2.0, 2.1, and <laughs> After they got to .NET Core 3.0, they realized they had a problem. If they released .NET Core 4.0 and .NET, <laughs> right. you have .NET Framework 4.x, there's all these all these issues are going to arise. So um, they decide basically with the, the next version after .NET Core was just going to be called .NET. And part of the impetus of that as well is to um, signify that .NET Framework is essentially done. It's not, it's not going anywhere. It's not going to be, you know, as long as Windows is around, it's probably going to rely on .NET Framework. So you can, if you've got your apps which are sat there, you don't have to touch them. But realistically, the future of .NET is in .NET 5 and .NET 6. So .NET 5 is essentially .NET Core. .NET 6 is still .NET Core, but it's, it's the future of .NET. That, that's a good point. With Microsoft's always had a commitment to like, 10 years of support. And so... When they ship a major version of Windows, it happens to have .NET 4.8 in it that resets a new 10-year time clock of support. Yeah, exactly. So you really don't have to worry about your, your applications, which you can just ignore to an extent. But then there's always that danger. If, if you ignore an application, it just has a tendency to rot. So um, yeah. All the libraries that it depends on, on top of that's those things, yeah, change or go out of support. Got to think about that. Yeah, exactly. And I think there's much more of a tendency now. I think people are far happier to leave .NET Framework behind in um, in their libraries because, f frankly, it is a, it's a big drag on, especially like open source uh, maintainers, including .NET Framework support can be quite difficult. I mean, you can't use any of the new span of T sort of performance things. You can't use any of the new APIs around you know, channels or what else you're, that's coming in the latest versions. So while you can be safe if you literally don't need to touch your application, if you are, you know, actively developing an app, you should really be looking at how can you move your apps to .NET five, .NET six. Mm -hmm. So with with .NET six, there Microsoft documentation still has the word core in it when talking <laughs> about web applications. Is that significant, or what do people need to know there? Yeah. So in the, in the original framework, you had ASP.NET which was the web framework for, for doing .NET. Um, when you move to .NET Core, it was called ASP.NET Core. And the trouble is, if you now, if you drop the core off ASP.NET Core, you get back to ASP.NET, but it's not the same ASP.NET as before. So the web framework is, as far as I know, always going to be called ASP.NET Core to differentiate it from that, that previous framework. So now you have ASP.NET Core that just runs on .NET 6. OK. So um, what is your what is your favorite method at the moment for web applications on, on top of .NET? For a while, there were quite a few people, you know, layering on JavaScript frameworks and other things, mixing and matching. Um, and what, what's your preferences now with everything available in .NET six? Uh, well, there's, I mean, the, the, for a start, there is a lot available in .NET six. That's 
that's one of the best bits. So it really depends what type of application you're trying to build. I'm quite a fan of Razor Pages, which is mm-hmm. um, a sort of just server-side rendered and is essentially a, a successor to, to MVC with Razor. Um, it's it's all essentially the same um, components under the hood, but it has a much nicer sort of page-based uh, feel to it. Um, so if you're doing server-side rendering, I, I think going with that works well. If you're creating APIs, then you've got two options now in .NET 6. You've got uh, the traditional sort of web API controller-based um, uh, framework, which is a lot nicer than in the previous version in ASP.NET because now MVC and Web API are all part of the same framework, so you don't have the conflicting namespaces and things like that. So if if you're moving from ASP.NET to ASP.NET Core, I would stick with the Web API uh, controllers. If you're looking at if you're starting a new application and you want to have APIs and you don't need a lot of don't need a lot of like the filters and layers of complexity which you can which you can achieve with Web API, but you don't necessarily want, then minimal APIs are a, a really good option. Um, and then on top of that, you've got gRPC, which is if um, an alternative to HTTP. So you, you can use that for server-to-server communication, particularly, and that's that's blazingly fast. And then you've got uh, Blazor in its two forms. So you've either got Blazor WASM, which is a uh, client-side framework, which essentially replaces uh, the Angular, React, JavaScript framework that you traditionally use. Um, admittedly, with some more bloat at the moment and caveats around its use, um, but that, that's the role that that fills. And then you've got Blazor Server, which is a whole other thing entirely, which is sort of a client-side framework in that you are building uh, is a component-based sending diffs of the HTML across the wire to uh, a client browser, but it's a stateful application. So it stays in memory on the server. And so you can directly access uh, the database and things like that, but without having to um, create an API layer or anything like that. When you're working with Blazor WASM, you have to have your Blazor WASM, which runs on the client, and you have to have your server application, which runs on the server. With Blazor Server, you just have one application. Uh, and it's all trade-offs for whichever one you're choosing. And it, it really depends on the application and the clients, that you're, um, the customers you're going to be serving, and how it fits into your the rest of your sort of application ecosystem. Can I ask you a philosophical question? Does anyone really want web applications? And I, <laughs> and I ask that I ask that because I, I I remember when web applications became popular, it was because installing new versions of software, which by the way, at that point in time was all desktop software, was so freaking hard and cumbersome. And when there was a way to do something from a URL launched application, everyone said, yes, I hate (laughs) installers. But does does anyone want the web or do they just not want to do installers? Uh, I mean, that. I, I would argue that they do on the web. As, as a personally, as a user, mm-hmm. I, if there's a web version of the application, I'll normally just hit it, with the exception of some uh, particularly graphics-based or, or not compute-intensive things. Um, it really depends. I think that the, the fact that if you've got to get someone to install something on a computer, it's risky, and you've got to they've got to have a lot of trust, and they're committing to something if they install something on a computer. If you hit a URL, it's it's easy. You know, as a if you're if you're doing public facing things, you want it to make as frictionless as possible for consumers. Yeah, and it, having having install that is is a massive burden. That said, it, you, it also does have huge benefits. Like deploying a fix to uh, a web server can just be instant, invisible to consume uh, to customers, and they don't need to know. Whereas if you have to ship an update for installer. That can be expensive, you know, in terms of time and you know, purely bandwidth. If you're going to be downloading 100 megabytes out of Azure every, you know, for every day, if you're releasing every day, that seems like that could start to cost up, uh, add up. Yeah, that's a good point. It was a, it was a loaded question with no real answer <laughs> because <laughs> there's so many different, you know, fragmented market segments. It's like, yes, there's a lot of people who do <laughs> want, they do not want to install anything, even if it is. Simple, simple. 
So, well, your book, um, even though you, you're in the second edition, um, it focuses on web applications in, in, in .NET Core 5, 6. Um, I want to ask about a few parts of it that, that really popped out at me um, in, your, in your table of contents. And one of them is testing your applications. You know, a part of your book talking about that. That is something that still is not, in my observation, is not a either widely taught or widely adopted skill set among web programmers. Um, what's what's your uh, philosophy and, and experience and guidance on testing .NET web applications? Yeah, so I mean, I, I can still sort of understand why people don't do it or don't know about it when you know there's so many new software developers and. I remember myself, like I, I wasn't taught that you need to test things. How I tested things by clicking through the URL, making sure it all worked. That's how I always just thought that's how you tested stuff. That's how and we even all do when it, I yeah. yeah, exactly. Even even when I found out that, you know, about unit tests, I was like, well, why would I write more code to to do things? That seems like it's just gonna be gonna be slower. And I and I feel like you need to you need to experience the difference that having good set of testing can bring you and realizing that you can ship something and have confidence that it's actually going to work by having that that suite of tests around things um i mean it's, it's not a panacea like obviously there's there's limits to what you can catch and there's a limit to the benefits that you can get from uh either unit testing or integration testing but uh, i think these days i can't imagine shipping a an app to production without having a good suite of tests around it to know that we're actually shipping something that's working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's the, the new, uh, playwright testing framework that Microsoft has been, been, uh, putting out there. Do you know anything about that or what's the, what's the latest, you know, through the, through the UI method that the developers should be looking at? So I, I haven't, I've, I've seen it, but I haven't actually used it at all. I've, I've always focused on the, um, and it's the sort of subcutaneous level. Like, so in the API, testing ideally actually against the database, because I find that you can abstract all that away. You can plug in like the different sort of SQL-like providers, which can be very useful. But um, I think with the advent of things like Docker and uh, you know, even SQL Server runs in Docker now and mm -hmm. things like this, I quite like having where you can spin up an actual instance of the database and you hit the actual database and make sure that everything is coming back and the database state is as you like afterwards. So um, I've always focused on that sort of layer just below the UI where things get messy. Many thanks to our podcast sponsor, Clear Measure. Clear Measure is a software architecture company that empowers clients' development teams to be self-sufficient, moving fast, delivering quality, and running their systems with confidence. Whether starting a new project or developing new technologies or techniques, Clear Measure sets up your team to deliver world-class results. Learn more at www.clearmeasure.com. Clear Measure, empowering software delivery. Well, another part of uh, that you go in detail in your book is configuring ASP.NET Core applications, and you, you get the, the the startup CS. Am I the only one that sees over time that startup class getting really unwieldy? With every library that you adopt, wants a few more lines of code in that one magic class. How how, how do we deal with that? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, well, you've done it six. There's no startup class, so well, uh, <laughs> you have. Yeah, you're, now, now it's all in program, but still, I mean, yeah. you, you have that one class that everybody wants to run a few lines of startup code. Is there any kind of structure or pattern that people should be thinking about to keep that that class from just bloating? Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm sort of joking about the startup, but it's the the, the getting rid of startup and moving it all into program kind of highlights the fact that you you do actually have to do something about this. You have to. Um, yeah, can control this bloke. Uh, one way I always used to have it was essentially creating modules, which were just static registration uh, classes. So if you have a if you have a module which is dealing with your employees, say, then you'd have a register employee services um, method, and then when you go back to your startup configure services method or you know program TS now, you just have you'd see services like add employer module, add customer module, add Mm. Know, repairs module whatever so i quite like that to, it's, it keeps your program class clean but you can easily navigate to where you're actually doing all these registrations so correct me if i'm wrong if I'm, if I'm hearing you right 
what I think that means is if I'm, if I'm adopting, I don't know, infragistics components or some other library and they say, Oh, to, a, to use us, put these three lines in your startup or your program class. You're saying, don't put them there, put them somewhere else in a class that I write and then have that one line of code to that class that I wrote in program CS. That, that is, that is what I tend to do. And so have common sort of collections of components together. Um, yeah, I, but I mean, the reality is you can do anything you want. It is just a method call. So any sort of way that you can break it up yourself to make it more readable, maybe it isn't more readable to have it. Maybe you do just have a registrations class and you just stick it all in there. Maybe that's fine. And I'd argue that, you know, initially, that's almost certainly fine. Initially, you can put everything in there. It's only when it gets to a point where you're like, what, what is going on here? That, oh, yeah. that breaking it out would actually uh, actually make sense. Well, if, if, you have a, if you have a house for you and your family, but your family is basically you, yourself and I, because you're not even married, don't have any kids, you could have a one, you know, efficiency one, re- you could live in a hotel room and it wouldn't even matter. But as you grow, it's like, oh, maybe I need a floor plan. Maybe I need more than just one room. It's the same thing with software, isn't it? If your application's tiny, you don't need much structure. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's part of the um, the pushback that everyone has had with some of the like minimal APIs and minimal hosting things are in .NET 6. Because like, they're very, the, the, the examples and the demonstrations are all very focused around the getting started experience. And it's mm-hmm. like a small application. And everyone's always worried that, well, if yeah, you've, you're putting all of your APIs in the same file, that program file is now 300 lines long. And yeah. everyone's gonna, it's just going to keep growing. It's just going to keep growing. But that's sort of missing missing the point that you can just move them elsewhere. There's no there's nothing forcing you to tie stuff in. The way the newer versions of ASP.NET Core are, they lie, rely far less on conventions mm-hmm. and uh, you have to do it this way as you can configure it any way you want. And you, or you could write a, a little, I'm sure there's frameworks essentially which sit on top and give you back that structure if you want to have a structure. It's definitely something that you can impose but it's not required to be in, in, the, in the actual framework itself, which is quite nice. Right. It's easy to say, oh, yeah, just invent a pattern for yourself and refactor things out and I'll do it. But there's somebody out there listening who has, has, the, uh, has the interest in being an open source author, creating something. And it's, I will say, your opinion, um, it's super useful to have a NuGet package out there where all it does is give us a canned implementation of some type of pattern and yeah, an organized program CS for larger and growing applications I think is needed out there. And so if anybody out there just wants to build it <laughs> and wants to just get in contact with me and come on the show and we'll pitch it, I think it's a, it's, it's a gap. It's something that would be yeah. hugely useful because the, the normal programmer out there is not just, is not going to, invent you know the right pattern for themselves it's kind of like we need we need uh some pattern out there it's like oh yeah that one's good okay let's just use that one yeah so there's there, there is actually already started to be this growing up less around the the startup hosting side but around the minimal apis because the minimal apis are very much just it, it feels like they're all going to be listed in one file yeah. but you know you don't want to you don't want to get to that point so there's uh, there's carter um which is a quite a well-known uh, open source package, which um, has been sort of essentially ported to minimal APIs. It provided, it was it was almost like the inspiration to minimal APIs in a lot of ways, I think, because mm. it provides a very similar syntax. Um, but it basically is built now entirely on uh, minimal API, APIs, as far as I know. And But it provides that module kind of structure. So it adds that layer on top and provides some convenience methods around that. And then there's another one, uh, Fast Endpoints, which I haven't, which I've heard about, but I haven't looked at, which combines minimal APIs with sort of a mediator pattern. So you can get that all in one without having to, um, you know, do, do all that yourself. So there, there is, I think there is growing this structure and these um, new patterns. Oh, that's a good point. We'll make sure to include those in our, uh, in our show notes. Um, yeah, I think fa- fast-endpoints.com. I think and, that's the one, yeah. And is it, is it Kartra? I'm not familiar with that one. Sorry, sorry, Carta. Carta. Okay, well, yeah. yeah, we'll include that in the in the show notes as well, just to get the right URL. That's good. These all these little frameworks. I mean, no one person can know all of them, but as yeah, pass the word. Hey, this one could be useful. Go check it out. 
Exactly. Exactly. And they, and they all have slightly different um, patterns and slightly different paradigms. And so it, it's about finding the one that sort of works for you and, and sort of jives with what, the way you like to build your applications. Right, right. And by the way, if anybody's making fun of me for not already knowing all these all these new frameworks <laughs> popping up, sometime, sometime, listener, you're going to get to the point where you, you know, can't even keep anything straight anymore and boom, right back at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you say, there's... It's so easy to start things now. It's so hard to uh, keep on top of them all. I mean, the the uh, the fast endpoints one I only heard on a on a um, podcast a, you mm-hmm. know, a few weeks ago. So it's just nice. It's it's a great way to learn about things. Nice. All right, I want to keep on uh, the table of contents of your book is is outstanding. It covers so much. And, and by the way, I ask you another question about it, but. You have an offer. You're you're promoting a a book offer at the moment, aren't you? Yeah. So we've we've got a discount code for. It. I'll have to get that to you. But there's also um, we've got a a free uh, book you can give away, uh, ebook version, which I will uh, send you a code for. Awesome. All right. We'll make sure to include that code in the show notes. And so just uh, wherever wherever you're listening to the podcast, pop open the show notes, and you'll be able to get that um, authentication or just just logging in. Playing a lot. Um, there's been so many solutions on how to log in to a web application. And now, of course, we have Auth0. We have, oh, sign in as Microsoft 365. Sign in as Google or, you know, all those providers. Um, there's so many options out there. Can you whittle down the options? Which ones <laughs> would you recommend? Or like, oh, yeah, you really should just pick from these several. Uh, <laughs> I mean, again, it depends what you need to do. Um, I am quite fond of not writing your own auth. That's mm-hmm. that's um, it's something people always feel I need to do. I need to have my uh, users table. I need to have my you know username and password. I need to have collect all these extra details. I need to handle all that myself. That is just such a, a huge huge effort to do in your application. And even with uh, the ASP.NET Core identity sort of framework which is built in you can you can do that you certainly can do that do you want to do that is a whole a whole separate thing mm-hmm. so i would encourage people to use a third party uh provider if you can whether, whether it is or you know or zero or octa or um which are now both one company is <laughs> which, yeah i just suddenly realized <laughs> that yeah <laughs> or um yeah microsoft b2c or depending on you know which which sort of uh platform works best for you they're, they're all pretty much the same these days they are all uh providing open id connect mm-hmm. um capabilities which means you can plug them into your application pretty easily and as far as i know there's some improvements going to be happening to that in uh, .NET 7 i believe there's been there's been talk about uh, them those being improved um the other major one is identity server or duende which is essentially lets you build your own um identity platform which, again, if you can get away without doing that, would be great. But mm-hmm. if you do need to do it, it's it, it provides everything there. I've, I've done that before, and it's it's so extensible that you essentially run a standalone application, which is like an Auth0. You run your own Auth0, essentially. Mm-hmm. And um, then all of your other internal applications or external applications can all authenticate via that one system. So it gives you a single sign-on throughout your um, all of your apps and that you need them. But again... If you don't need to, don't do your own auth system. <laughs> yeah, there was a there was a time that that I remember where someone d- was building or, or having built their first web application, and so it was, oh well, nobody logs into anything. I guess we need to have a way to do that. But it seems like today, every one of the potential users is already logging into something from the company in some fashion. Whereas if you're making those design decisions. They might might already made be made for us. Where it's, what, how are they already logging in? Okay, well we needed to tap into that and just just use that. Do you, yeah, agree, exactly. you agree with that general method? Uh, absolutely. Like if your if your company, for example, uses let's say like yeah, Microsoft accounts or a Google account, if they're already authenticated with that, you can plug in again using the OpenID Connect protocol. It's um, most the big providers certainly uh, support that. That's it. That's all you need. You'll have you'll get back the user t- sort of ID, and that's all you care about. You know that the user is authenticated. You know who they are, and you can, don't have to worry about any of that 
sort of protection of the accounts. You know, if someone tries to uh, spoof the account, if they try to you know brute force a password, all of these third party providers like yeah, like Google and Microsoft, they they're all detecting these things. They're all blocking it for you, and it's not on you. You don't have any passwords to lose. You don't have any you know any, anything like that. So um, mm-hmm. that is definitely the approach to take. And it's it's so much easier. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And as we kind of get to the end of our time here, I, I wanted to make sure that I asked you about custom components. It's another another section of your book. Um, and this is another one where just in my own observations, not enough developers choose to build custom applications when it's a great opportunity. And they just, you know, sling, sling more HTML, more CSS and more and more basic controls. Instead of you know, making higher level components. What's your, what's your thinking on that? So yeah, the, the custom components in there is normally when you, so things like um, in, injecting validation and using uh, creating custom validation providers in in .NET. It's it's things where you reach the sort of the, the edges of what you can get out of the box, and it can be essentially it's super useful. You it can get you out of just holes that you would otherwise be trying to spend ages working around. And um, it's not essential as a beginner, but if you can learn where, like how things work actually under the hood, then you can tap into these so easily. This is this is partly where, like, where I started the blog, because basically just sort of looking through the source code, finding out all these little edge edges that you can you can hook into quite happily. They're there, they're they're public, but they're not necessarily as well known as as other bits because you don't need them most of the time. But when mm-hmm. you do need them, they, they can just solve your problems incredibly easily. Yeah. I kind of think it like um, object-oriented development in C Sharp, you, you make a decision on when to make another object, which is a, comp- a composition of other ones, and it's just kind of doing the same thing in the user interface. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're, yeah, from, from that sort of uh, that larger component view, that's sort of in the sort of Blazor component style, I completely agree. Like you, you, you start with little ones and then you make a bigger one. <laughs> and the, the, then it's, it's, it's nested by that, you know, suddenly it makes it easier to compose your applications with these entire controls. Mm-hmm. And then there was a big third party, um, like you said, there's a big third, third party uh, market for that, those now. There's all of the uh, big providers have jumped in with various blazer controls like Telerik and Infogistics and oh, things yeah. like you say. And they are, they're really good. They're, they're so they're, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I'll, man, any listeners out there that are not at least piloting and seeing what's out there from the commercial standpoint, oh, gosh, they're so good. They can save so yeah. much time, so much code. So. Absolutely. Well, hey, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to come on the Azure DevOps podcast. We'll make sure that everything we talked about, include that in the show notes and the offer the, the code uh, for the for the free ebook. And uh, and as well as links to everything, including AndrewLock.net, your awesome <laughs> blog that you keep you know, keep trucking along on, and, and ASP.NET Core in Action, the book from uh, Manning Publishers. So, uh, is there uh, is there anything else that the listeners should hear before we sign off for today? No, that's great. Thanks very much. It's been uh, it's been a pleasure. Awesome. Hey, the pleasure's all mine. Thanks so much. Well, that includes our show for today with Andrew Locke and that special offer a free, free book, um, we're going to do a random drawing. And so for the first couple weeks, this podcast is out from publication date. Just uh, if you want to get in on the drawing, if you want to email me at Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y at clear-measure.com. And uh, we'll, we'll do 14 days from the publication of this episode, and then uh, do a drawing and we'll hook you up with Andrew Locke so that you can get the free book. And for everyone else, uh, we will be distributing the discount code in the show notes. So until next time, keep shipping. You've been listening to the Azure DevOps Podcast, a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Go to www.azuredevops.show for show notes and other episodes. On behalf of your host, Jeffrey Palermo, and our sponsors, thanks for listening, and may God bless you.